Good evening. Appreciate Yona leading singing. Sometimes you lose your voice. It happens. And the beauty of simple worship is that we can still continue singing praises to the Father. All right. And that's the blessing of, uh, of New Testament Christianity. Sermon of our lesson this evening is the church and her shepherds. It's a lesson or series of lessons that I've been meaning to teach and preach uh, in our congregation. And it wouldn't matter where I would be, I would still preach these series of lessons. But before I continue, I do want to say something about the shepherds of the Honolulu congregation. One of the things that I truly appreciate about Ren, Ralph, and Pat is the fact that they are teachable, that these men are humble men. And they are not power hungry. And that is a blessing for any congregation. Because there are those who are in the position of shepherds that do lord it over the church. That do treat the church in ways that Jesus would never do. And so, in the first installment of this lesson, Pat, Ren, and, and Ralph, I am going to focus on you. And, and so, regardless of, of, again, of setting, it is, according to the scriptures, that a congregation would hear lessons about shepherding. It is according to the scriptures that even the shepherds hear lessons about shepherding. And that's the, the goal of this series. Gospel preachers have been instrumental in this relationship of the church and her shepherds. As a matter of fact, we see it in the history of the church that God used ministers, apostles, prophets, preachers of the word to help ordain or appoint shepherds for the church. And it was always God's plan that there will be shepherds. I'm speaking to the choir, shepherds, bishops, elders, overseers. Those are different titles, but they all name the same group of men, the shepherds or the elders. Notice in Acts chapter 14 and verse 23, that when the Apostle Paul and Barnabas were traveling in their missionary journeys, that they made it a point to ordain elders in every church. Yes, in every church. Acts 14 and verse 23. So when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commanded them to the Lord in whom they had believed. The church in Ephesus had Timothy who was ministering to them. And we have the instructions in the book or the letter of First Timothy, where Timothy was instructed by Paul to ordain elders. And we have the listed qualifications there in First Timothy. When Paul sent and left uh, Titus in the island of Crete, he left him with a mission. 
that he is to fill in or to promote and to establish what was lacking. And what was lacking in the churches of Crete in every city was there was a need to appoint elders or shepherds. Titus chapter 1 and verse 5. Paul to Titus, for this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I have commanded. And so whenever a congregation, it's in the process of ordaining elders, there has to be a man who knows what the word says in order to help in the appointing of those elders, men or few men that, uh, that know what the word says about it. But not only that, even in congregations that already have elders, the preacher or the minister is often key to the relationship of the shepherd and the church of the shepherds and the church. I want us to first of all, concerning shepherding, to be reminded of our God, that God is the shepherd. God is the shepherd. In Psalm 23, which was written by a shepherd who understood the nuances or the, the needs of the sheep that is in David, written by a shepherd about the shepherd. Now, you and I know the life that David lived and how often, especially when running from his enemies, how often he relied on God's provisions, on God's protection, on God's promises, and so on God's providence. David uttered these words, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they strengthen me. You prepare a table for me before the pres before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup runs over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. As members of the body, it is often when, and, and I'm not speaking about our congregation, and maybe you felt this way. It is often when the shepherds do fail, we look to the shepherd. And you can find comfort in them. That God will always be there. That God will always provide. Secondly, I want us to be reminded of Jesus and what he said of himself. That he was the good shepherd. Now, for the sake of our time, I want to encourage you, read Ezekiel 34. Read it on your own time. And then go back and read John chapter 10. The entire chapter. Because Ezekiel 34 is really God 
pronouncing judgment on the shepherds of Israel who failed at shepherding the people of God. And then you read in John chapter 10 what Jesus said of himself. You can see the comfort of the Jews to hear someone say, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Contrast to those of Ezekiel 34. They wouldn't make a sacrifice for God's sheep. Skip down to verse 14 of John chapter 10. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and am known by my own. Verse 16 of the same chapter, the other sheep and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring and they will hear my voice and there will be one flock and one shepherd. One more verse I want to highlight here from chapter 10, verse 27 and 28. My sheep hear my voice and I know them. And they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Any shepherd would do well to consider what Jesus said of himself. Because the good shepherd makes sacrifices. Shepherds, we ought to make sacrifices for the flock. The good shepherd knows his sheep. Shepherds, you are to know who is in your congregation. Who is there and who is not there. One of the things that uh, a shepherd wrote about in Psalm 23 is the state of the sheep called a cast sheep. Now, a cast sheep is a sheep that has turned over on its back. And when that sheep is left on its own, like, like no one's coming to rescue, it will kick and it will cry. All right, you know how sheep cry? And eventually, in that state of being cast, it will die. And so the good shepherd looks over his sheep. That he knows every single one of them. That when he looks over his sheep, he's looking to see, well, do I have all of them? Wait, the count is off. I'm missing several of them. You know, the first thought would come to mind. One of my sheep is cast. And so the good shepherd runs to that cast sheep, restores it on its feet. That's when David said, he restores my soul. He restores it on his feet and he would massage to get circulation going through. And then that sheep would survive. The good shepherd knows his sheep by name. Good shepherds know who are in their flock. They know who's missing and who's not. But I'll spend more time on that later. Last um, two more applications here before we get to the lesson. Jesus said, other sheep I have. Good shepherds, they create an environment where people feel welcome to be part of the flock. Now, contextually, Jesus was talking about, I have Gentile sheep that I'm bringing them to, and I'm going to make them one through the power of the gospel. Yes, Jew and Gentiles were able to live in harmony because of the gospel. Good shepherds create a harmonious environment, regardless of the differences among the flock. And then last but not least, as Jesus is the good shepherd, he leads the way. Good shepherds are always in the front. They're always before the congregation. 
their voice is heard. There isn't anyone in the church that would say, who are the shepherds? Because they would know who they are by the way they lead the sheep. As I say, the focus of our lesson this evening is the relationship of the shepherds and God. All right? We will talk about the relationship of the shepherds and the church, and the church and the shepherds. And then we'll talk about the relationship of the shepherds and the world, or the world and the shepherds. All right, so those are the lessons. Tonight, I want to start off first with Acts 20 and verse 28. Paul said to the elders of the church in Ephesus, whom he called a meeting to come and meet with him in Miletus. And I want to highlight, there's a lot of things he said to them. But I want to highlight this verse because the, the essence of our, our series comes from this verse. Paul says, therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. The first part or the first lesson focuses on the first part. Take heed to yourselves. Now, if you are a shepherd listening to this lesson, this is for you. Now, if you are someone who aspires to be a shepherd, and I want you young men, young people, to think about this. You want to be a shepherd in the Lord's church. There's no greater responsibility than to care for the souls of God's people. First of all, let's, and I'm Mr. Obvious. <laughs> First of all, the shepherds are appointed by God. The shepherds are appointed by God. And they are appointed by God through the medium of the word. They, they are appointed based on what the Holy Spirit gave us in scriptures as the qualifications for those who would serve in this office of the church. So I want you to go there or follow along on the screen because I want us to read all of these as a reminder to us. Paul to Timothy, he, he's instructing him. These are the qualifications for the eldership. Or for one who desires to be an elder. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good thing or a good work. A bishop then must be blameless. The husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous. One who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. You know why there needs to be men who understand the qualification? Or as I started off, you know why there needs to be a minister in the process of appointing elders? Because someone has to stand and hold the stander up. Someone has to do it. Because there is that tendency of straying from the standard. And so someone has to say, these qualifications must be met. And it's not like you should appoint men who might 
meet the qualification. It's not about potential. This is about these men have shown that they are the husband of one wife. Yes, it has to be a man because a woman can't be the husband of one wife. Even though there are churches with women shepherds. I, I can't believe it. But these are the qualifications. And not a single one of them. Should be compromised. Right? Because they are appointed by God. Any man in that position. And desires that position. Will seek to fulfill God's purpose. In that position. And because they are ordained by God, I know sometimes we say, my elders, our elders, and there's truth to that because they are caring for the congregation. But if they are ordained by God, it's important to remind them, you are God's shepherds. You are. Not me. Not anyone else. And you have to uphold the standard. So number one, and that's the obvious one, right? Or a great reminder. Let's remember that. It is God who appoints the elders through the medium of the word of God. Through the qualifications that are written. To do so any other way would not be ordained by God. To select men that don't meet all of these qualifications will damage the flock and will hurt the flock. And church, I've seen it. I've heard the stories. Secondly, the shepherds are God's examples for the church and to the church. Where there is a Christian that comes in wanting to know something, wanting to grow, wanting to, to ask questions about how can I do this? What does the Bible say about this? These men are the example. Go with me to 1 Peter 5. Peter was also an elder. That's why we know he was not a pope. He was not the first pope because he was married and he had children, as some would claim it. But Peter was a shepherd. He acknowledged himself a shepherd in this letter. 1 Peter 5, beginning in verse 1 through verse 4. 1 Peter 5, verse 1 through verse 4. The elders who are among you, I exhort. I, who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Command, shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers. Peter, in what manner? Not by compulsion, but willingly. Not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, that is Jesus, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. I will comment more on the relationship of, of the church and the elders, but I do want to say this church, the elders are not perfect men. As you remember, we are all sheep under the care of the great shepherd. And there are time, there are times when these men who are shepherds, there are times where they stumble. Because they're human, right? And so one of the attitudes, and I'll talk about attitudes in a second, in a different lesson, but I wanted to highlight this since we're reading it. One of the attitudes that we shouldn't have 
in the church is that when an elder makes a mistake, we jump to the conclusion, well, he shouldn't be an elder to begin with. To the shepherds. And again, I mean what I said about the shepherds of Honolulu. These men do not lord it over us. At least that has been my observation in the past five years. To be examples to the flock, to the church. In what areas? Go with me to 1 Timothy 4. 1 Timothy 4. Christians are called to be examples in the faith. And Paul gives a list here, a worthy list to follow. It's not the only list that we are to consider. But for the sake of our time, we'll look at this list. 1 Timothy 4, verse 12. I know it's said of Timothy, but the shepherds should be leading in this area. And I've seen their great example here. Let no one despise your youth, but be an example of the believers in word. In what you say. Jesus said what comes out of the uh, what goes into the mouth does not defile a man is what comes out of the mouth that defiles a man for what's inside comes out. And I have never in, in any occasion. See any of our shepherds here stumble inward, maybe they have, but I'm, I'm speaking from my perspective. They have modeled this. You know Ren and his gentle and quiet spirit when speaking to you, even though it's a tough subject <laughs> to speak to you about. You know Ralph and, and his gentle and caring voice and the measuring of his word when he speaks. And then Pat being seasoned as he is. He does his best. But they are to be examples in speaking, in word. How do they speak? Are they angry when they speak? What are the words uh, that you hear when they speak? Be an example in word, in conduct. How do they live? What is your view or perception of who they are right in the way they live in the way they speak in their love do they really care about souls do they care and love the church i imagine there's always room for any man to grow in his love for souls and the church but gen but generally do do you see that and to our shepherds, you look within. Do I love the church? To be an example in word, in the lifestyle, in love, in spirit, in attitude, in faith that is demonstrated in the actions taken through challenging times, when people are in need, through teaching of the word, faith is demonstrated last but not least on the list here by paul in purity we just sang holy 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 in the manner of holy living they are to be the leading examples to the church shepherds you are to be that example last but not least uh, there's much we can discuss but last but not least and we'll cover it in the series the shepherds will be judged by the shepherd or by God. They will not be judged by you or me. They will have to stand just like everyone has to stand before the judge. They have a greater 
responsibility to answer for because they are over the flock. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17, I imagine it was probably a very challenging time for those elders in that context to try and shepherd a flock that is constantly being persecuted and people are wavering in their faith. Do we follow Moses or, or leave the law of Moses and follow Christ? It was probably very challenging to be a shepherd to those whom the Hebrews writer is addressing. And so he says to the church, and there's more on this in the lesson between the church and the elders, but he says here in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17, obey those who rule over you. Sometimes we, we behave like the eldership has no authority. They do have authority. They have delegated authority as the shepherds. And when they make decisions that are good for the church, they don't need your permission to make those decisions. Are we okay with that? Again, there's more to it in the lesson between the church and the elders. But I wanted to highlight that since it touches it. Obey those who rule over you be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. In other words, one day Ralph and Ren and Pat, one day when the Lord comes, they have to stand before Jesus and give account of how they shepherd the Honolulu Church of Christ. Not some other church out there, the Honolulu Church of Christ. So to my brothers, Ralph, Ren, and Pat, remember the gravity of the responsibility that you have. As those who must give an account, let them do so with joy. More to that in our relationship with them. Because we can make it difficult for the shepherds to shepherd. But the Bible says we should make it easy for them. We should make it a joy for them. I love to see shepherds that are happy to care for the congregation. They have a part to do. We have a part to do concerning that. Let them do so with joy and not grief, for that would be unprofitable to you. The shepherds are ordained by God. And if we ever want to, to grow our, 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 our shepherds or to, to, to add more to the eldership, it will be done by the standards that God has given. The shepherds are to be examples to the flock. They are God's examples to the flock. How can I live my life? Look to this man who has experience. Look to this man who went through life and still remained faithful to the Lord. They are, to, they are the examples. And last but not least, the shepherds will have to stand before God. Not before you and me. They will stand before God. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we come before you, Lord. Thanking you, Father, for your plan for the church and how in your wisdom, Lord, you, you intended and it is your will that every congregation of yours will have shepherds, men who are spiritual leaders, Men who care and have the compassion for souls. Men who love you and have a strong relationship with you. 
Father, we pray for Ren, for Ralph, and for Pat. Father, that you continue to allow them to grow. That they continue to be teachable men. That you keep them, Lord, from the pride of having power. And lording that authority or that power over the flock. Father, we pray for their wives. For Tina, for Rose, for Lala. That you also be with them. As they also, Lord, have their role in shepherding. As they both share the encouragement of service. But we also know they both share the burden at times. Bless their families, Lord, as they shepherd our congregation here. Father, we pray for our young men and anyone who is seeking to be a shepherd, Lord. We pray for more and more hearts to look at being a shepherd as something that they should desire for your glory, for the benefit of your church. We thank you so much, Father, that we have elders here at the Honolulu Congregation. Help us in our relationships because we love you, Lord, and we want to glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. Are you a part of the Lord's fold? Maybe this evening you are not. You need to hear the word of God. The Bible says faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. You need to believe Jesus is the Son of God. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You need to repent of all your sins. Paul said to those who wanted, uh, who were listening to his sermon about God, he, he, he said to them that God, at the time of ignorance, he overlooked it. But he now commands man everywhere to repent. Repent of your sins. Confess Jesus is the Son of God, but with the heart one believes unto righteousness. With the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Be baptized as you make, when you make that great confession, be baptized for the purpose of washing away your sins. As Peter said to the audience at Pentecost, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then you be faithful. Be faithful to Jesus every day. To the church in Smyrna, Jesus said, you be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. If you need to respond to the invitation this morning, or this evening, we invite you to come forward. We want to help you as we stand and sing the song of encouragement.